This test has three parts. In occupational, occupational English test. Practice test two. Listening test. This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1, questions 1 to 12. You hear a consultant endocrinologist talking to a patient called Sarah Croft. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Good morning, Mrs. Croft. I see your GP has referred you to me. Yes. OK. Well, I've got some notes here with his referral letter, but it'd be helpful if you could tell me in your own words the sort of problems you've been experiencing. <sighs> OK, well, I've had high blood pressure for several years, but these last few months that's tending to get worse. Mm. I've been on corticosteroids too these last three years or so, and that's a result of the fact that I've suffered from asthma since my teens. I see. But I understand you've developed several other problems recently. Oh, yeah. As you can see, my stomach is huge. I've put on a lot of weight and it seems to be concentrated there. Mm. And um, oh dear, I don't know what's happened to my face. All this hair which has appeared, it's so embarrassing. <sighs> And something else which I didn't notice at first, but which other people have pointed out to me here, see, in between my shoulders, oh, yeah. is this, well, I can only describe it as a hump. That really bothers me too. Yes, I can see. Um, and look at my ankles, you know, they're swollen too. Something else which has got really bad is that I'm also sweating so much, even in cold weather. No amount of antiperspirant seems to help. Yeah, that must be difficult. Um... And any aches or pains? Uh, well, my, my back tends to ache a bit, but I take ibuprofen, which helps. Good. My periods used to be painful in the past, but to be honest, they're so infrequent now that the pain really isn't a problem anymore. Mm. I often feel tired, though. In fact, like, really tired. And what about your skin? Oh, yeah. It, it seems to bruise at the slightest thing. And I've noticed that if I get a cut or a scratch or something, it takes ages to heal. And something else I've spotted on my thighs, see here is these stretch marks. Oh, yes. They're quite noticeable because they're a real purple colour. Mm. My face has changed too. I used to have quite pale skin, but as you can see, it, it's quite red now. And it looks, well, puffy. I mean, it never used to look like that. OK, so there's been quite a change. Oh, definitely. And if you look here on my neck, the skin's gone dark. Really odd. I don't know what's happening. And th though I never really had it before, I've now got acne into the bargain. Uh, it must all be distressing. I, I can appreciate that this is having an effect on you. Um, have you noticed your general mood changing at all? Well, it's enough to get anyone down, really. Mm. And yes, I do feel a bit depressed. But the frightening thing is that I've started getting mood swings. I've never had them before. I mean, one minute I'm laughing and the next I'm crying and I don't know why. Mm. It's quite alarming. Anything else? Well, I confess I feel, well, 
irritable all the time? Everything seems to get on my nerves, and I can't seem to concentrate like I used to. You know, I find it hard sometimes to do stuff in my head, like working out a psalm or remembering names and things. Mm. I, I just hope that you can find out what's wrong with me. Well, I'm sure we will. Um, now, I see you've already had some blood tests, but I'll need to do one or two more. You've had a urine test to look at your blood sugar, so I probably won't need to repeat that. We may do a saliva test, depending on the bloods. OK, I see. And how long will everything take, I mean, before we know what's causing the problems? Well, I'm afraid it can all take some time, as diagnosis can be quite complicated, and we may need to take... Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. You hear an anaesthetist talking to a patient called Mary Wilcox prior to an operation. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. So, Mrs Wilcox, you tell me you've had high blood pressure. So, are you taking any medications for that? Yes, um, a blue one and a white one. Mm -hmm. And do you know the names of the tablets? Yes, so one's thiazide okay. and the other one's lisinopril. Perfect. Thank you. That's very helpful. And have you had them this morning? Yes, well, that's what the nurse told me at the pre-assessment, yes. So, is that all right, just mm. with some water? I usually have them before breakfast, but she said no food at all this morning. <laughs> Excellent. And apart from the high blood pressure, do you have any other medical problems at all? Uh, yes, I take some blood thinning drugs because I had a small heart attack a bit ago, mm. so I'm taking aspirin. And um, at the pre-assessment, they said to keep on with them. So I have one this morning, like I usually do. Mm. Uh, they told me to stop the other one. Um, I can't remember the name. Uh, Warfarin? Um, no, it begins with C. Uh, cl Clopidogrel. Mm. Uh, they told me to stop it a week before the operation. Seven days. Fantastic. So I stopped last Tuesday. Great. Now, tell me a bit more about this heart attack. How long ago was that? Uh, two years ago. My GP picked up on it. Did that all go...? Yes, uh, pretty good. And why did you go to your GP? Were you having chest pains? Uh, they weren't chest pains. They were... Uh, um, I was just getting a bit breathless, and it was difficult for me to tell what was going on, but uh, Dr Scott picked up on it when I went to see him. And uh, he sent me to the cardiology team. Right. Did they say you'd had a heart attack? Yes. They told me I'd had a small one. And so I had some stents put in, uh, a couple of them. And since they were done... Yes, I've been better. You know, I, uh, I don't feel so tired all the time. OK. And what can you do in terms of exercising? Well, I can do anything. Uh, anything, really. Mm -hmm. um, tell me what you can do. Well, we have stairs at home and uh, we don't have a loo on the ground floor. It's on the first floor. So I'm up and down a few times a day. Mm -hmm. And walking on the flats, fine. Yes, that's OK. Any problems with your ankles swelling? Well, this one, it swells up if I've been standing. Oh. Uh, I had my veins done, my varicose veins. But uh, the other one's all right. Uh, I sprained it quite badly last year, but it's fine now. Right. Um, can I just ask you a few other questions about your heart? Sure. 
Have you ever had any palpitations at all when your heart goes bum bum bum? Uh, no. You've never experienced any of those? Well, no, no, not really. I mean, if, if I run, my heart beats a bit faster, but that's normal, isn't it? Sure. Um, anything else? Any digestive problems? No. Oh, well, if I have a heavy meal late at night, uh, like if, if I have a pastry or something, I sometimes wake up in the night feeling a bit um, like heartburn. Uh, but if I take an antiacid, it's fine. Right. So, in general, you sound to be in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. Now, in a minute, I'll tell you about exactly what type of anaesthesia we'll be using. But first of all, is there anything you'd like to ask me? Do you have any concerns about anything? Um, well, I suppose the main thing is after the operation, uh, when I wake up. Um, I mean, will I be in a lot of pain when I come round? No, you'll be given morphine during the procedure and that will still be working when you wake up. And then, when that wears off, you'll be given something else. There'll be someone keeping an eye on you. OK. Oh, uh, uh, the other thing is, uh, I've heard that if you have crowns in your mouth, they can get damaged if they put in an air tube. Well, it's unlikely, but we'll take special care. Uh, so, which teeth are we talking about? Uh, these two. OK, the two central incisors. And do you have any other teeth with crowns or implants? No. OK. So, what we have planned for you is to... Take that is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. You hear two trainee doctors doing an activity at a staff training day. Now read the question. So, what did the trainer say we have to do? Well, we've got to look through these case notes, 10 sets in total, and decide which of the patients should be referred to the consultant as a matter of urgency and which can wait. Oh, right. And did I hear him say there's a limited number you can refer? Not exactly. He said that we should put them in rank order according to the severity of the symptoms and other factors evident from the case notes. Once we've agreed on our list, we have to go and compare with another pair of trainees. Okay. Let's get started then. Question 26. You hear a radiographer talking to a patient about her MRI scan. Now read the question. Come in, come in. Mrs. Brown, isn't it? My name's Ted, and I'm going to be doing your MRI scan today. Now, can you get up on the table for me? You know, I'm really claustrophobic. Well, this is a new piece of equipment. The diameter is much larger, so it should make it a little more comfortable for you. <clears throat> You'll also have this call bell, so if you need me at any point during the test, you squeeze that, okay? Okay. Now, your scan's only going to take about 15 minutes. Are you okay with that? Well... I am. OK, let's get started then. Question 27. You hear two nurses discussing an article in a nursing journal. 
Now read the question. Did you see the article about research on strokes and sight problems in the latest nursing magazine? Yes, I found it interesting that there's quite such a high degree of visual impairment after a stroke. Yeah, but I think I could have told them that without an expensive research study. Well, you need evidence to get progress in how people are treated, and now there'll be a push for all stroke patients to have eye assessments as a matter of course. It certainly makes a pretty solid case for that, especially as there's plenty that can be done to help people if early screening diagnoses an issue. Absolutely. I was just sorry the article didn't provide more detail about the type of sight problems that are most common after a stroke. Well, there's a reference to where the whole study's been published, so you could always find out there. Question 28. You hear two hospital managers talking about a time management course for staff. Now read the question. The uptake for the course in time management for staff has been disappointing, hasn't it? It has, but I'm not exactly sure why, because everyone seems to know about it. And we asked for it to be changed from a four-hour session to two two-hour slots to make it easier for nurses to be released from their wards. But apparently that wasn't possible because it has to be done a certain way. Yeah, I'm not convinced that was the problem anyway. I think once staff become aware of what it's aiming to do, and how it fits together with other initiatives, there might be more interest. Yeah, there certainly is a need, even if the staff themselves don't actually realise it at present. Question 29. You hear an optometrist reporting on some research he's been doing. Now read the question. I specialise in dealing with fungal eye infections. At present, treatment involves giving eye drops every hour for at least two weeks. I wanted to improve this process by designing a system capable of releasing antifungal drugs onto the eye over an extended period. Contact lenses are perfect for this, as their hydrogel structure has the ability to uptake and release drugs, and their placement on the eye ensures the drug gets released directly to the cornea. In order to make a contact lens provide drugs over a sustained period, I've modified the lens. I've also used nanoparticles for packaging the drugs. So, I've managed to create a system capable of delivering an antifungal drug, called nanomycin, for up to four hours. I now hope to increase this, and use this system with other drugs. Question 30. You hear a consultant talking to a trainee about a patient's eye condition. Now read the question. Have we got uh, Mrs. Kent's notes? Yes, they're here. She's coming in today for possible laser surgery for her retinopathy, isn't she? Well, depending on results. And from the look of these pictures we took last time, there's been a slow improvement. So we'll talk to her, and perhaps hold off for the time being. Unless her condition's worsened, because it can in some cases. So what's the cause? Well, we know a leak of fluid behind the retina causes the distorted vision which sufferers get but not why that occurs. There may be a link with stress and also steroid use, but the jury's still out, I'm afraid. That is the end of Part B. 
Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear an interview with a neurosurgeon called Dr Ian Marsh, who specialises in the treatment of concussion in sport. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. My guest today is Dr. Ian Marsh, a specialist in the treatment of concussion in sport and a co-author on a new set of guidelines. So, Dr. Marsh, what's the aim of these new guidelines? Well, the aim was really to provide a resource, um, not for the top-level professional sports people, but for parents, teachers and coaches of young people playing sport. Mm -hmm. The guidelines basically offer some expert information from a GP an emergency physician and myself as a neurosurgeon about what the condition is, also how to identify the symptoms and how to manage it. If any of your listeners have ever had a concussion doing sports, you'll know how frightening it can be. It's confusing and um, painful and difficult sometimes for teachers, parents or whoever to work out if someone with concussion is OK. I mean, we hope to remedy that. Mm -hmm. And how do we know when someone is suffering from concussion? Well, obviously, if the person's actually knocked out, it's clear. Mm -hmm. But not all patients actually lose consciousness. Often, following a hard knock to the head, they become disorientated or experience headaches, nausea or vomiting. Um, these are signs of concussion and they may clear initially, but then return when the individual actually undertakes further physical activity, right. when they start to train, say. So it can actually take quite a while for things to really clear up. The essence of it is that people shouldn't start playing again until those warning signs have completely subsided. Yes, and you say that waiting anything less than 14 days after all the symptoms have cleared would be too early to return. Yeah, that's right. If they go back too early, they risk a second concussion. And as we know from professional athletes, they may have to give up their sport if they have too many concussions. Right. So it's better, particularly in a young person with a developing brain, to allow all of the symptoms to settle and only then return to play. Mm. Well usually return to train first, then return to play after that. It used to be thought that receiving another concussion could lead to severe brain swelling, and that could be fatal, or at least involve a visit to the emergency room. I think the evidence is fairly slim for that. 
What we do know, though, is that the compounding effect of having one concussion followed by another seems to be more severe than just the one. So it's always better to let the brain recover fully before playing again. Right, so who's at the highest risk of sports concussion? Well, actually a concussion can happen whenever anyone receives a blow to the head. Usually it's a sort of twisting blow, not a straight-on blow. But obviously people playing sports like rugby, where there's bodily contact, stand more chance of being at the receiving end of such a blow. But having said that, it's just as likely to affect kids kicking a ball around a park as it is to affect top professional players in big matches. Mm. Do you think that youth sports need specialist concussion doctors on hand, like the professionals do? There's always a risk, and we know that it happens from time to time. But I mean, most games, even the most dangerous ones, are without incident at all. I think people who are involved in running youth sports, whether they be referees, coaches or parents, can be made aware of how to manage concussion, the signs that they need to look out for, and maybe the warnings of something more serious so that they can take the appropriate actions. Mm. But I think always having a doctor on the sidelines where young people are playing is just an overreaction. Right. In the USA, college football is big business. They're trialling helmet sensors and impact sensors. Do you think that's something we need everywhere? Well, I don't think it'll come to that. I think there are two scenarios here. The first is one where a concussion's a one-off event following a significant blow to the head. Right. The second's quite different and involves chronic traumatic encephalopathy. This comes about particularly in American football, where players use their helmets and heads almost like weapons. That type of repeated impact seems to add up over the player's career. That's something we've heard being discussed, mostly in the USA. Naturally, there's interest generally in protecting players, particularly in the professional levels of sport, but I see that as a different matter to the management of concussion itself. Now look at Extract 2. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear a presentation by a consultant cardiologist called Dr. Pamela Skelton, who's talking about a research trial called SPRINT, which investigated the effects of setting lower blood pressure targets. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Hello, I'm Dr. Pamela Skelton, consultant cardiologist at this hospital, and I'm talking about the recent SPRINT study into the effects of setting lower blood pressure targets, which in turn affects the advice and medication which patients are given. I'm going to describe the patients who were selected, how the trial was conducted, 
and the implications of its results for us all as health professionals. First, the trial itself. It involved over 9,000 hypertensive participants aged 50 plus, most of whom were on blood pressure medication. They were randomly assigned to one of two groups, one with a goal of less than 120 millimetres systolic BP, the other with a goal of less than 140 millimetres, the traditional standard. The intention was to follow these patients for five years, factoring in the usual dropout rate. As it turned out, however, the trial was stopped after just three years, thanks to an all-cause mortality reduction of nearly 30% for the 120 group, which was definitive and shocking, but wonderful. As I mentioned, the participants were over 50s, and it goes without saying that as people age, they develop more diseases and health problems as a matter of course. But there was a specific group of over 75s who did just as well as younger patients. Before the trial, some medics referred to the natural stiffening of the arteries with ageing, suggesting that 120 was too low a target for the over 75s, risking an increase of dizzy spells, which would affect general well-being. But this concern turned out to be unfounded. Others thought there would be a failure to take the number of tablets needed to reach a BP of 120, especially among older participants. Again, this wasn't an issue. The average needed was just three per day. The over 75s, already on various drugs, didn't object to extra medication. Participants from this age group who didn't finish the trial were taken out because some conditions which were already present worsened. For example, in some cases, obesity levels rose too high. To manage their blood pressure, participants were given standard drugs. Nothing experimental, just drugs that are readily available and low cost. Another key factor was that blood pressure was measured in a very specific way. Rather than give patients an arm cuff for at-home 24-hour ambulatory monitoring, an automated machine was used at the hospital. This took three separate readings and averaged them. Also, readings were taken while staff were out of the room to avoid what's called white coat syndrome in patients. Now, some of you may be familiar with the ACCORD study into blood pressure levels several years ago, which in some respects was similar to SPRINT. There are some differences, though. For example, ACCORD was about half the size of SPRINT, and unlike SPRINT, the ACCORD study allowed diabetic patients to take part. Despite this, in general, the ACCORD participants were rather lower risk than those in the SPRINT trial, probably because of the slightly lower average age. The ACCORD trial didn't show a statistically significant benefit for overall cardiovascular outcomes, but there was a clear 40% reduction in strokes, even though that was a secondary outcome. So to summarise, the SPRINT trial seems to support 120 as a recommended blood pressure target. This is doubtless a landmark study, and importantly, one which was sponsored by government rather than by the interests of pharmaceutical corporations. I recommend a note of caution, though, as SPRINT does contradict previous findings. The Cochrane view, in 2011, for example, said that lowering to under 140 didn't produce a change in the risk of death overall. However, we must bear in mind that Cochrane was looking retrospectively at trials which weren't actually focused on the same particular issue. So it's worth doing a full and systematic evaluation to see where the SPRINT trial fits in with what we already know. It's interesting that a few GPs have already been working with older patients to hit lower blood pressure goals, and the new data will doubtless encourage greater take-up of this more interventionist line of attack. 
but the sprint results don't mean that everyone with hypertension should be dropping to under 120. Plus, to achieve those lower levels, it's unlikely that lifestyle changes alone would be enough. It could well require several antihypertensive drugs as well. There remain some unanswered questions, of course. For example, whether other groups, like those with a lower heart attack risk, need to keep their blood pressure that low. So, while SPRINT can help guide doctors' decisions about some patients, it doesn't mean that a new universal standard for blood pressure is in order. Instead, it's a good reason for everyone to discuss with their doctor their own ideal and particular target. That is the end of Part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers. MedCity gives you 30% discount for online OET. Free study materials available with CDs and special grammar classes. We assure 7 plus band score for ILTS. Other courses are German language and nursing courses. MedCity, Kanur, Kottayam, Mangalore.